We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. Hi guys, welcome to the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Compass. I'd like to take a minute to talk about one of our sponsors, Parker Sporlin and Thermostatic Expansion Valves. How can you guys always have the right thermostatic expansion valve for the right application without having to carry hundreds of valves in your truck? Well, that's simple. Using Sporlin's interchangeable cartridge style valves, the Q valve for conventional and the BQ valve for balance port. It, it, it's as easy as one, two, three. It serves thousands of unique applications. So one, you just select a thermostatic element for your application. Two, you select the body style you need. Three, you select the right size cartridge for the application. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you always have the right valve for the job on your truck. For more information on the Q and BQ valves, visit Sporland.com. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. This uplifting cinematic experience. Uh, I've got something important to tell you, man. The big story is... Dig this and dig it. Hi guys, welcome to the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Compass, with my uh, co-host here, Brett Wetzel. You, all right, Brett, I'll let you uh, take the floor on this one, what we're going to do tonight. <laughs> so tonight I want to talk about... What's that? 
<laughs> no, go ahead. So I want to talk about uh, conden- uh, condenser troubleshooting a little bit tonight. I've I've had a, a a problem that I had a theory and and I got shut down from the from the manufacturer and I just want to discuss it a little bit and and try to figure out I don't know try to try to figure out a solution for this thing. Can we also talk about accountability? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, I, man, I have a problem and, and, you know, Kevin and I have talked about this before, uh, with the, some of the projects and some of the, some of the grocery stores where they're, they're putting in three or four, um, open air cases down the store and they have a single condensing unit. And, you know, I've seen so many posts on, on this particular project where, you know, they, they say that there's not a problem, but like everything I come up with says that it's that it's oversized um i had two other engineers look into this you know just to make sure that i wasn't just you know full of crap and um right now i have first first things first anytime an oem tells you it's never been a problem anywhere else they're lying straight to your face (laughs) never never well that's the thing like we you and i have had this discussion uh, prior <laughs> to today and you know we came up with the with the same thing so i what what i'm seeing in a lot of these units is where the the suction pressure is just way 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 too low for what it's trying to operate and you know so the condensing unit i was on when i when i first started all the fans were on on a 70 degree day so um or maybe it was 75 regardless it was it the, the the discharge pressure was 190 180 on on 448a um and no matter you know no matter what i did you know the the coils were kind of blocked and it was only feeding uh, a little bit of the coil um you could you could tell because basically the saturated uh the saturated condensing temperature w- was real low but the satur- saturated suction was real low as well and you know, we've discussed TD, you know, typically we see anywhere from uh, 10 degree TD all the way down as far as four. On this particular set of cases, we have a six degree TD. And before I made any adjustments the first time, the I got the, uh, what I did was I upped the discharge pressure, the saturated condensing temperature. And I did that with fan cycling. And by doing this, I was actually be able to raise my suction pressure from negative 13 degrees saturated all the way up to a whopping you know seven to 14 degrees saturated which is you know on a medium temp case if you're trying to maintain 32 degrees you would go six degrees less than that so what's that that's 20 20 26 26 degrees saturated yeah that sounds right so 26 degrees saturated in order to maintain 32 and we were maintaining negative 13. So we've also had this discussion about TD, right? So if you have an evaporator that's sized for a one ton coil and it's at a 10 degree TD, then it needs a one ton expansion valve. If you end up decreasing your suction pressure for any means, now you have a 20 degree TD. Now that that coil now requires double the amount of refrigerant that it initially you know, needed. And so if you know if the valve's not big enough with the range that it's not going to have enough refrigerant to feed through and that that's been my argument for this this particular uh system uh basically my suction pressure is too low by way too much which is causing my uh my td to be astronomical and on this one it's even worse because if it's supposed to run a six degree td and it's a one ton coil now if i'm running uh let's see if i'm running if I'm running now a 12 degree TD, now now it's basically needs to be a two ton coil, and that's the problem where I have where you know all my expansion valves, my pulse width expansion valves are opened up 100. percent They're not pulsing at all; they're staying open 100. percent And in turn, this is causing uh, high superheat. And because I have 30 degrees of superheat on every single electronic expansion valve, I'm only utilizing I think like a, a an eighth of my coil. And the only reason why I can say that full heartedly is because typically on a coil, right, we have, we don't have superheated vapor until the very, very end. 
Um, there's a defrost termination sensor on the second pass. And on the second pass of this coil, it's already starting to superheat, which tells me that we don't have enough refrigerant. So either every single electronic expansion valve is blocked or every single uh, uh, nozzle is blocked or I, I would think that I'm oversized causing this astronomical TD, which is causing the valve sizes to be basically undersized. So I just want to throw this out here. I see this much worse with pulse valves. Remember that Amazon store? That was pulse valves. Yes. Um, with SER valves, I mean, it doesn't seem to pop up as much. And then same thing with the standard TXVs, because I've, I've, I've done the same units. I don't have pulse valves on any of ours, mm. but we have X-Line units. And they're not as oversized. They're a lot closer. We're running like a plus 13 mm. degree evaporator, but mm. we never, ever, ever make superheat. Like it, the, the vet, like we don't even get enough runtime to make superheat. See, that's, that's it where instantly. I have tons of runtime, but like, like I said, I, I'm maintaining, well, the valves are open 100%. The valves are open 100%. So yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think it's a true 100%. Now, now, now that I'm like kind of going about this a little more, it it's a pulse valve issue. Well, you're saying so change out the pulse valves to bi <laughs> bipolar stepper. If you put bipolar steppers in there, or if you put TXVs in there, I don't think the problem was would be as bad. I think this 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 problem is so the TD on the coil obviously makes the the valve bigger or makes the valve size well, need to be bigger mm -hmm. yes we know that that's true a normal txv and a ser valve i think the porting on them has enough flow through it where it at least makes up for it i don't think that the the pulse valves do see the only other option I'm, that that i have is to basically Put in a bigger port you know what i mean because by putting in a bigger port you, the pulse valve is going to shut down anyway it's going to cycle the way it is so i like I, i've never seen a pulse valve yeah. oversized i mean i guess if it would open up for two seconds and then flood the freaking coil but i mean that thing would have to be huge on top well, of the fact you have the distributor no. nozzle we have that issue at aldi with the co2 stores they uh i'm like the meat coils they do they mm -hmm. like it like in it has like one of the smallest Danfoss pulse valves in it and it'll pulse for like two seconds and it like floods out. But what I'm saying is I think that the condensing unit being so oversized is increasing the TD on the coils, like you said, and it's undersizing the pulse valves to the point where the, the they're already undersized to begin with probably no, I mean, they usually, no, I mean they, they're they usually size them uh, pretty spot on, but like I said, it's it, it's causing because you know, like here here's the thing. So I could I could cheat the system because we've had the the biggest problem is we've had the compressor shut down multiple times. So the theory is is that because you're barely fe feeding that first pass with any mo with uh, with refrigerant, right? You have a lot of moisture here into the coil because the saturated so low. So that first pass becomes extremely uh frost laden so once that happens then at one point you are going to lose airflow so once you lose airflow right then what's going to happen is your expansion valve is then going to clamp down which is going to cause an excessive uh lower suction pressure because now you basically lost airflow so it doesn't want to feed that valve anyway the suction pressure goes real low the cooling goes real high and then you have the core core sense module on there it's saying hey i shut down because i overheat it well, I look, you know, just for shits and giggles, I looked up the uh, the engineering spec on the on the AE document. I think it was like thirteen eighty four or something like that. Um, but basically, I looked up the spec for that particular compressor. So the compressor that's on there uh, is only allotted to pull down to thirty seven. It says the minimum low pressure cutout is allotted to be thirty seven psi. I'm barely running that as running, so it's not like I can put in. Uh, an EPR because if I do that, it's going to exacerbate the low suction pressure. Yeah, it would help my TD, but you know, I wouldn't, I'd end up overheating that compressor, just cooking it even more. 
Um, so my, yeah, you know, you, my, my fix for it for the time case. being, go ahead. You almost need another case. Like you're, it's like, you're almost short a case. <laughs> right. And that's, and that's what I'm thinking. Nice. Well, and, or falsing the load, you know, hot gas bypass, de-superheating, just bringing that pressure up um, to bring that saturated suction up just to have the capacity I mean, that you need. That's how targets cheating the, 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 the sizing when they, uh, when they get close, they Absolutely. also don't let certain engineers size their stuff. <laughs> I mean, just, let's stay away from that one. Um, but basically, I, what? No, come on. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you you you're you're falsing the load up to get your saturated suction temperature where you need to get your runtime, but also let the system balance out. I mean, those those same cases on the X line units. I mean, we were averaging like six minute run times from call to pump down. See, so I mean, it's running long, like it, like it's actually legitimately running the whole time, you know. Be, but like I said, it's a medium temp compressor operating all the way yeah. real real low. Because your valves are so undersized, that's the problem. Because the coil TD is even lower. So, like my my the the stores we had, the the sizing wasn't as bad. So was your yours was a walk in though, right? No, mine were mine were cases. They were the open they cases. were the same grab same same grab and go open cases with uh, they were hill cases. Yeah, Q QC 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 dash R. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, those cases are more efficient than what Hill says. Yeah. Like, you know, which is which is unusual, but like those cases, the 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 coil TD was like two to three degrees at max. Um, off those cases, so I mean they're more efficient with the, what they say, but I mean this is the problem with putting these high efficiency cases and condensing them. It doesn't work. It it does not work. Yeah. See what what target I mean, does. What Target does, like you said, they they have they have another yeah, digital output. I mean, that, that, but even that barely works. I mean, technically, you're probably violating every Title Twenty Four, whatever you know, ridiculous California code that there is for that. I mean, because you're, you're let's be honest. You're I mean, a false load on it. You're wasting energy doing that. Okay, you're you know also what? You know what? having that unit break down every week. Well, that's not my problem. I get paid to fix it. <laughs> I, I, I'm done. I'm done being it, uh, an engineer's engineer. Um, you know, it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because, like, I'm like once once I every well once I once I wrote I, I wrote an email and I was just like you know just dropping theory just you know just to make sure i wasn't you know and i ran it by someone first to make sure i was like this this sounds right right and he's like yeah absolutely 100 percent." and then after i got the, the response today where it was no <laughs> then i'm questioning myself i was like do i really know what i'm doing <laughs> Meet the newest field piece vacuum pumps and vacuum gauge. The HVAC R power couple. Separately, they're amazing, powerful tools. Together, they are a force to be reckoned with. Offering a high level of speed and accuracy are game changers for the HVAC R techs in the field. Our vacuum pumps, the VPX7, the VP87, and the VP67, are lightweight, portable, and feature four inline ports. Our wireless vacuum gauge, the MG44, has a no slip grip and reversed angle coupler, which means it's easy to manipulate and install in the toughest spots. Visit us at fieldpiece.com. For more information, follow us on social media at Fieldpiece Products. What's the proper superheat on a medium temp case? This is for the third question on the field piece giveaway. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats,
These floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. You superheating. Oh, tandem compressors. Um, they they make you know they make smaller smaller condensing units that actually have. That sounds like a, like a straight coke fuck though, like tan like a little. I mean, at that point, just put a fucking rack in. <laughs> well, that's the point. That's. What... I mean, if you, if you're going as far as tandem compressors, like that that is that is ridiculous. We get some tandem like CR machines in there, some like little like little like restaurant style walk in ones, like some tandems, just like put together all like redneck two two eighth horsepower motors with the tiniest oil separator. <laughs> some shit that would roll out of fucking one of these OEMs. I gotta tell Adam he's gotta design the separator that's good enough for an eighth of a horsepower. <laughs> Do you, you ever see that baby temperate one? I don't know who posted that. It was like the size of a soda can. Huh? Yeah, it's smaller than a soda can. Is it really? Yeah, it's 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 like a straight two inches shorter than a soda can. <laughs> that damn thing probably still blew its fucking O ring on it. Yeah, man. I just yeah, like it's it's just frustrating because like, it, well, what have I? Like when you get that response back where they're like, "No, you're wrong," and I'm like, "No, no, no, no. this is where you get them. You tell, prove it." I could prove it by putting in a bigger orifice. No, 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 no. make make them prove it. I think that's what's going to happen. To be honest with you, if you think you're that right, I do. Don't let them. Off. I do. Just put put it put it put the bus right in line and just hammer down. I'm not gonna do that. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I do whatever. Like honestly, it's it's the resolution. Like I, one, the one of the guys I called, but uh, they're not I, going, huh? They're not going. They're they're gonna ignore the problem until it goes away. Oh, I, I'd they're have. I, I, so there's an engineer that I know uh, when I worked up at Pennsylvania for Devault Refrigeration. Uh, the guy's name is Chris Capshaw, and and he's just he's a brilliant engineer. And I was just like, Chris, you got to help me here. Like, I'm, I'm up, up a creek without a paddle, and I, I need your help. And we went through all the numbers, and he's like, no, it's – it." you know, he was questioning things that I was saying. But he's like, no, no, that sounds right. That sounds right. And, like, I even sent him the condensing unit guide, the, <laughs> the, the, the case guide for the QC cases. And, yeah, I mean, he agreed with me. And, I like, it's just – it's frustrating because – what else do I do besides, you know, let them, let them come back at me. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, if they can fix it, then I'm going to feel like a big ass, but I, you know, I'll, I'll learn something, you know what I mean? But I, I don't think I am. I don't think I'm wrong. And I just don't know what to do. <laughs> it, it, certain manufacturers just stop responding to emails till the problem goes away. Really? Like every single day. <laughs> Yeah, nothing nothing new works you're like this is you're like the testing ground of like guess and check and put on a class when i was out in anaheim the one time and they were they were asking about startup how how startup how startup i'm like everything's your fault and they're like what what do you mean i was like it it doesn't matter just from here on out as long as you're doing startup everything is your fault the controls aren't right it's your fault if the refrigeration is right your fault if the plumbing isn't right it's your fault it's just your fault. That's just the way startup works. Kevin, how, how much are you with a whipping post? Like every time, but I, I've, I've like turned into a psychopath. So like I go right after to these OEMs. Like they are, they see me and just sigh. I mean, I do the same thing. 
But I, I whatever. I, I learned a game. I mean, the, I mean, they, they don't want to take accountability for anything. I mean, when you're sending out cases half assembled, when you're sending out condensing units missing parts, when racks are missing parts, when there's things half brazed, or like th- things that oh yeah we we are indeed these. And then you find out it's like the first store, and uh, they don't want to admit no, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's the response I, I hate. Well, that that's I that's. Know. that's the, I know that's that. See, that's the frustrating part because like you and I have had a conversation about this. I've seen at least a half a dozen posts about the same freaking issue. And this is the first time they're hearing about it. Yeah, I, I I know of at least five different companies. I mean, ours were more so with the X line units. I yeah. think that the X line units are getting harder to get, so they're peeling off to uh, they're peeling off to uh, other manufacturers. Yeah. Value engineering. Yeah, the, I the, mean, the, but like, what I mean, honestly, like, if my because Chris was saying, you know, just if the unit starts short cycling before it actually makes the temp, then it's it's definitely probably oversized. And I said, well, I could make it do that because I mean, basically, I it shouldn't be running at the pressures that it currently is. You that's not I mean? true. You could okay, so. Think about this. If you have a cutout, like I live in Chicago, it's fucking cold as balls here. Yeah. I mean, our 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 cut-ins and cutouts for 448, you're cutting out at like a pound or two and cutting back in at like five or six pounds, maybe 10 pounds. So you're telling me a medium temp condensing unit is gonna that that is oversized is gonna cycle on a low pressure switch. I find that hard to believe. It may be running like 15 pounds. 12 pounds, 20 pounds when it should be running like 52, 52 pounds. So you're telling me that it's going to, it's going to short cycle on low pressure. Not necessarily. Yeah. If you absolutely screwed the boat on here and uh, you, I mean, you, you put a four horsepower where you need a one horsepower. Yeah. That's, that's different. It may just like short cycle, like a Banshee. But if, I mean, if you're, you know, one compressor size too big on something, then yeah, I mean that with newer stuff, that's a problem. With older stuff, I mean that that's not as big of an issue. I mean, you could run that colder TD and not have an issue. I mean, now it, it's it's almost impossible to run new HE cases on condensing units without some sort of capacity control. And when you start throwing pulse valves in there, I mean there's no point in putting that in there. All, all you're doing is making the problem worse. I mean, you're better off with the standard expansion valve at that point because that pulse valve is never going to do its job because it's never going to be able to run long enough because the, the condensing unit is never going to have the right operating parameters. It's never going to be in that operating range that it should be in. Um, it, it's unless always it's, gonna, at, unless like, it's at the most highest ambient that it can be, like what the design was. Yeah, even at that, I guarantee if you were running it, at 107 like you said i guarantee you that thing the suction pressure probably would still be low how much capacity would you lose not it wouldn't be that much i'll let you know in a second i was gonna say i thought you would have had these numbers ready i'm, I'm very disappointed <laughs> today today I mean, was today, today was a very it, messed up day Oh, I know. It's, it, it, we hit 90 for the first time in Chicago, and everything's on fire. All the CO2 racks are dumping their charge. Uh, all the repairs that nobody, uh, every customer declined because they didn't need them. Uh, all of a sudden, they need today. <laughs> performance, dynamic performance. Okay, so you're saying if I go uh, uh, 107 degrees saturated, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so at 100 degrees saturated... You are running. At sixty-two thousand five hundred, and currently, I think I have it set to about eighty-five degrees saturated. So sixty-two five, 
85 done. Uh, do, do, do. It jumped up uh, to 69,000. 69, so just, just going from 107 to 85, jumped it up 7,000 7, BTUs. I mean, that's a decent amount, but if, if mean, the whole, I mean, if the whole load is, that's almost an eighth of the load. I mean, that once again, it's like putting another case on there, right? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think these should be undersized slightly. I would rather see uh, a condensing unit undersized a little bit with a case than oversized because I would rather see that runtime, get that runtime in there with that higher suction pressure than I would to see it like slammed down. But these engineers always put that fudge factor, that oh shit factor in there. Well, I'm going to add 10%. Then the next guy adds 10%. Next thing you know, you're 30% over and, uh, you know, everything's messed up. There's, there's no room for that fudge factor. I mean, especially when you're selecting condensing units, that difference in uh, capacity is what, you know, messes up your coil saturation. So say like Copeland says, this is a 25 SST compressor, you know, at this BTUs. Okay. Well, when you grab the next one down, because your BTUs are slightly over, say you're like, you know, a thousand BTUs over 2000 BTUs over that engineer grabs that next size down. Well, now that drags the saturation down to like a plus 15 at the same, at the same BTUs. And now we get the short cycling, but I think the pulse valves, makes it 10 times worse because I've had the issues with no, you know, with low saturation. I mean, you get sort of high superheat, but I mean, the pulse valves, they, they, like those Amazon stores, like I, I proved it. Like they, they had to put EPRs in those coolers, those dairy coolers, because they would not make 10. Those pulse valves would be at hundred percent. And what did Hill Phoenix come back and say? Oh, throw bigger orifices in there. I said, but you don't need bigger orifices. I go, look, we shut the ball valves down. I have the data to prove it. We got the saturation down where it needed to be, ran it for two hours, and the thing ran beautiful at 20% pulse valve, uh, six degrees of superheat, 35 degrees, you know, perfect. So, I, man, I, honestly, I, I, like, I like when pulse valves actually are controlled by EPRs, but the problem is, you know, a lot of, a lot of manufacturers, they want to not put in an EPR. You know, and and we we have another store that has a, a similar issue with the pulse valves, where you know they we have a hard like time like maintaining. The, huh? They act like it's 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 a cheap like sell. Like, oh, we're gonna give you this. It's your liquid line solenoid. It's your defrost valve. It's your temperature control. It's God's gift to you know control. But like you you can't run it like so anyway so. Remember the the podcast we did with uh, Joe Sig, where he was talking. We were asking about the the flashing and the liquid line, right? And he said a lot of that time is is due to low velocity. So we we have a, a cascading rack that has an issue where, you know, all the electronic expansion valves in the store are basically at zero because the the sat the lowest saturated suction is the heat exchanger, so that's plus eighteen. All the rest of the cases are set for at least thirty. So that means they have to operate at like 26. So you're already up and operating really, really low. So they don't open up because the cases maintain temperature because the suction pressure is so damn low. And then it causes rivering in the sight glass, which causes high pressures because we don't have flow. But it's one of those things, like if those valves would pulse just at even a minimum percentage, you know, it would keep it keep the, the, the flow up enough. But I mean, it, I just, I, when using pulse valves, I would like to see PRs being used, but unfortunately in this instance on the single condensing unit, we can't because we, our suction pressure is already running low and it, you know, it's already running so low that it's actually causing um, the compressor to shut down on overload because it's, it's running outside of its operating envelope for way too long. I mean, that, that's where these X lines would come in, like with these digital compressors, but I honestly don't think they could take it. No, you think they'd be unloaded too much? I think they, I don't think they would last. Really? I think they would get beat up. I think they would get beat up way too much. I mean, the, the, the unloading and loading and all that stuff. And, but here's the other problem with that. When you get into uh, pulse width modulation, which I don't want to get too into this because the next podcast is going to be on this. 
when you start, you know, messing with two different forms of PWM, like you have the pulse width for the, you know, case temperature control and the superheat, and you have the pulse width going for the, the compressor, I mean, you're never going to end up with a steady process variable, meaning superheat, ever. You're never, ever going to be able to control that. Even with like digital compressors and stuff, like, uh, like they do not recommend using like digital compressors with anything with electronic. Like if you're if you're just using digital compressors with electronic, that's why the, that's why those Amazon grocery stores had so many issues because they had Copeland Digitals on there, and your suction pressure goes you know up and down two three pounds two three pounds constantly. You know, as it, you know, every couple seconds as the digital unloads and uh, loads. Well, that affects all your process variables because there's no EPRs to be a buffer in between the rack and the actual cases. So now your process variables are going two pounds up, two pounds down, two pounds up, two pounds down. Well, that is messing up with every superheat calculation and that is messing up every PID loop in the store and it ends up spinning them up or they don't know how to react fast enough because all the tuning in the world cannot fix that. Yeah. I mean, I honestly think it's an issue with the sizing of the pulse valves. I think the porting and the pulse valves is too small and that is making the problem worse. Well, that's what I was thinking. Uh, the only other thing that we could do to prove my theory is is to um put in a put out a big orifice sure. on the on the sporlins can you drill it out hmm? go ahead and drill bit and drill it out i'm not doing that <laughs> i'm not doing that at all absolutely not no way <sighs> so what do you we didn't even get into it what are you, what are you working on this week Besides, doing besides PM. racking up your phone bill. Yeah, I'm doing a PM. What? Yeah, we're out of work. Doing a PM on like all my the Sam's Club, all my construction startup guys got old. We're all the other guys are running service and uh I'm doing a PM. Got no cases, got no racks. <laughs> the equipment's just behind. Yeah, you know they they keep they keep blaming Kofifi. It's been going on for two years. <laughs> great, great excuse, but we never get to use that excuse. Why are you guys behind COVID? No, 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 you can't say that. But you guys also when their case is late, and uh, we still got to make the same deadline. Oh well, they they had they had the the, the Kofifi hit the factory. Yeah. No, but yeah, but you know what? I I've no because oh, you said everything's on fire. I'm sensing everything's on fire already. We we are now at, at uh huh. Welcome to summer. Well, no, man, it's it do it gets worse every single freaking year. Oh every yeah, and this year. worse every single year. Like the equipment has like gone down in this like steady downhill climb of just trash what do we got to do to get more people like, in the industry cases made out of plastic. oh i mean who who wants to come in i mean people don't want to come into this <laughs> uh i took a bath in a cooling tower today it was wonderful oh it's my hair, disgusting my, my hair smells like biocide <laughs> oh so you get, you get out of your office what's that you got out of the office. I did get out of the office. <laughs> Although uh, it's that that that's a cluster too. Um, we, uh, we 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 got a store and they have lots of uh, hydronics. So they have a primary condensing loop, secondary condensing loop, chilled water loop, and then a uh, heating loop. And it's just been one thing after another. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm uh, I spent my whole day washing a rack room, so oh, that was you, that was I'm, you I'm, down that rack. 
Oh yeah, I'm doing apprentice work. It's, it's great. Where's your, where's your, where's your, where's your, your uh, what the hell did you call that pressure washer? Boss Hoss or something? What the hell did you call it? Yeah, the, 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 there ain't no money for a hot seat in this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, somebody. I, I, I mean, I bought my house for once. Like, I'm not driving five hours, you know, there and back, you know, there and back to work. So, I mean, the pressure washer's four and a half hours the other direction. So, you're the one who wanted to do startup. You could do regular service work. Well, they, be close to home. No, I always end up like two and a half hours away from my house. Really? Yeah. They don't, they don't have any work in Indiana. They do, but the majority of our work is in Chicago. Tell me not so, leaving. <laughs> yeah, that ain't gonna work. Well, guys, I think we're gonna call it a, a night tonight. I was hoping to get Brett more riled up about this, and you know, actually get him to, you know, maybe throw a jab out there at somebody. But doesn't look like it's gonna happen. Really, very, very disappointed. Yeah, I thought I thought I was rubbing off on you a little bit, but no, no, no. I, I can be frustrated, but I'm not going to start dogging everybody. Give it two more weeks. <laughs> All right, I'll guys. Every night I need a shower. <laughs>